Um, obviously, today I chose to focus on overcoming the score and finding harmony, four key ingredients uh, to this big idea, especially because of the times we live in. I mean, it's no secret that we live in perhaps one of the most divided times in the history of uh, this country, maybe in uh, the history of our world. Uh, you know, we always took proud in being one nation under God. And that one nation is really, that oneness of the nation is really being threatened these days. Uh, not just with the riots, but also I think with the public discourse, with the uh, uh, tremendous um, animosity and uh, hatred even that's been communicated. And I think therefore, if we cannot count on the world to change, we can only count on ourselves to change. And um, in a way, there's a blessing in the decentralization of leadership, so to speak. If we can own our own sense of leadership, and we, that's what God expects of us, really, to be leaders in our own rights. So if maybe worlds and governments and um, other big organizations are limited in their impact, then maybe it's time for us to step in and uh, take ownership over this specific topic, this most essential topic. Unity and harmony can be restored in our society, in our nation, and in our world. So that's why I focus on this topic, but I will say that I encourage everyone to, as I always say, to continue to send me topics that you may have that you'd like to explore. I, I want this to come much more from you than from me, so please feel free to share with myself or with Janet any topic that might be on your mind for future classes. Okay. Um, um, I wanted to do one more thing here, but okay, it's fine. I just have two chats. Yeah, I wanted to mute. I'm trying to mute everybody so that it can flow better. There you go. I'm going to mute all. And then, of course, if, if you have any questions, there you go. Mute it all. If you have any questions to ask, feel free to unmute yourself. And then ask the question, this should be, as we all always say, much more of a dialogue than anything else. That's what learning is all about. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and, uh, and to a question or share your comment. Or you can do that also via the chat icon at the bottom, at the top of your screen, depending on how this appears on uh, your uh, computers. But again, I encourage questions and feel free to turn this into a real experience of learning. Okay, so let's begin. Overcoming the score and finding harmony, a topic that is so essential to our times. Uh, I believe that Judaism offers many, many ingredients uh, to unity, to achieving unity, to achieving harmony. Uh, but I selected today maybe the four most important ingredients that Judaism has to offer regarding uh, this goal, this united goal that we all ought to have, especially during these times. And um, if, if you think of a different goal, or if you disagree with one uh, of a different ingredient. If you disagree with one of these uh, ingredients, again, feel free to speak your mind. Let's go right to it. Ingredient number one, and that is that every person is God's representative. I don't have to remind you, and therefore I didn't bring it as a reference, but I don't have to remind you of one of the first verses in the entire Torah when God created Adam and Eve. The first, one of the first things he said about that creation, the human creation, is Betzelem Elohim bara otam. God created them. In the image of God, there's an imagery of God in every single human being, big or small, young or old, uh, regardless of races, background, creed, color, every single human being carries a reflection of God. What does this mean? It doesn't just mean that we are divine, but what it means also is that we have a divine purpose within us that makes us one with the divine. And uh, uh, I, 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 I know, I mean, Judaism again teaches that this divine purpose is found in every so single human being, even in the most unassuming of them. And where do I, do I learn this from? I think one of the most vivid examples in the entire Bible, in the entire Tanakh, is the example of Hiram. Hiram was chosen as the craftsman by King Solomon for the first of the uh, three, third one, please God to come very soon when Mashiach will be here, but first of the three temples in Jerusalem. When King Solomon, who lived some 3,000 years ago, decided to build this temple for God where God's Shekhinah 
where God's presence would dwell, he looked for different craftsmen. But he, cho he chose an unknown, an unassuming man from Tyre, Lebanon, not even from Israel where he lived, but from Lebanon to come and be his personal craftsman. He's one, the one that's, that's uh, in charge of the construction of the entire temple. Let's read the verse and let's speak about this Hiram a little bit because I think this conveys this most important ingredient for overcoming the score and finding harmony. Verse number one from the book of Kings again describes how Hiram was chosen by King Solomon to lead the construction efforts of the temple. And King Solomon sent and took Hiram from Tyre, Tyre in Lebanon. He was the son of a widow from the tribe of Naphtali. And his father was a man of Tyre, a brass worker. Now, what this means, by the way, he was a son of a Jewish woman from the tribe of Naphtali, but a non-Jewish man, a Lebanese man a brass worker from Tyre. He was filled with knowledge and understanding and intelligence to perform all of the tasks involving brass. He came to King Solomon and performed all of his tasks in the construction of the first temple in Jerusalem. Now, a Barbanel, who was a Spanish commentary of the 14th century, who himself was very, very close to the king and then had a big fallout because of his own Jewish identity and he had to uh, ex, uh, take upon himself this exile from country to country. But he has a beautiful commentary on why Hiram was chosen. Who was the leading craftsman to build this most spiritual home? A simple Jew, Hiram, whose mother was an impoverished window from the not very famous tribe of Naphtali, and whose father was not even Jewish, but rather came from Tyre in Lebanon. Now, why does the Babanel say that King Solomon picked this man to teach maybe all Jews and all humanity of all times, that sometimes the most unassuming man, the man that comes from an assimilated background, right? An uh, 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 intermarried background, the man that doesn't even live in your country, that seems to be impo an impoverished man from some foreign country, from Tyre, Lebanon. That man that you dismiss so quickly has the, most, the greatest divine powers, and he has the greatest ability to build a temple for God. King Solomon, I'm sure, had many, many different craftsmen. He was the king. He had the greatest connections in his times. But he chose the most simple man. Why? To teach us all that no one is really as simple as he or she seems. Every human being has that infinite power to become God's representative and build a temple for God. This is exactly what Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liadi is saying in his own words here on, on this episode from the Bible, Hiram, who was chosen as one of the lead builders of the te first temple, teaches us, never underestimate your indispensable role. Never denigrate your great calling and potential. Never gaze at yourself or at others as simple, insignificant people with little or no role to play in God's creation. It is from a Jew exactly like Hiram that the future of the Jewish people is forged. And it is for a person like you or anyone else that our world can be built anew. I think that's maybe one of the most important, if not the most important of the four ingredients that we are about to study about. Yes, very often we encounter people that seem to be so subpar, as they would call them, that seem to be so uh, simple to use a nice term. And we dismiss them. We overlook them. But by dismissing them and overlooking them, we're also dismissing and overlooking their immense divine potential to build a temple that can change the world. If we were to relate to one another as divine beings that were created in the divine image, that have a divine purpose, that if fulfilled can change the world, then there would no doubt be this great harmony, this great unity among all societies, among all people of all kinds. And this is exactly what the wisest of men, King Solomon, teaches us with choosing Hiram. He chose him, even though he had many other great construction com companies to convey this exact message. And friends, if I had to say if I, where it begins, I think it begins in the home. Very often with our closest ones, with our spouses, with our children, we get uh, heated up and then we dismiss them. And we forget so often that there are such divine beings. I remember, I'll never forget how I was sitting with a couple uh, not too long ago, maybe a year or two ago, and they were complaining about their teenager son who had become a rebel in their eyes at least and did all sorts of 
uh, bad things. I mean, which teen teenager doesn't go through a stage like this, but they thought it was unique for them. And then uh, the husband, the, the father was so upset in the middle of our conversation. Then all of a sudden he blurted out, and I knew this would happen. I saw it coming from when he was three years old. He stole something from the tzedakah box. And I knew this guy is going to be a villain when he grows up. So I said to him, so then what are you complaining about? You always saw him like that. So obviously he became like that. Maybe if you had seen him differently and when he was three years old and when he was four and five and six, he would have become a different person. But because of your limited, narrow-minded, dare I say cruel vision, you were, did not allow that divine purpose in your child to erupt and change the world and illuminate the world and make things better for your family and for our society. It was you who started this narrow-mindedness and started this limitation, this suffocation of his divine potential. Uh, so again, I believe that this begins with our own families, with our closest relationships. Then it goes to the rest of society. But I think that ingredient number one, therefore, almost demands from us to turn to relationships that might be broken within our own social networks, within our own familial networks, and say to ourselves, well, maybe I should repair those relationships because maybe King Solomon was right. Maybe there is a divine potential, even in someone that is so uh, far away, emotionally, psychologically, and even geographically, like a guy like Hiram from Taya Lebanon. So it starts with us. If we are to heal our society, we are to heal first and foremost the broken relationships within our own circle, within our own networks. That's where it begins. That's ingredient number one. And again, feel free to disagree. Feel free to voice your comments and to ask your questions. I'm open to all of them. If we, there are no comments and questions about ingredient number one, <clears throat> then we can go to ingredient number two. You know, uh, who was it? I think Mahatma Gandhi famously said, be the change that you want to see in the world. So let us be that change. Let us repair those relationships within our own networks to see that change then um, occur in the rest of the world. Number two, <clears throat> ingredient number two is love and care, which is connected to ingredient number one. But I think also it connects to the general idea of love and of caring for people, even when we are not in the mood, even when we, don't, uh, we do not feel like this. Where do I learn this from? I learned this from two general ideas that are also in our Torah, an idea that was just communicated to us this past weekend over the festival of Shavuot. During the festival of Shavuot, we speak of how the Jewish people had a sound and light show just before the Torah was given to them on Mount Sinai. And in that sound and light show, they weren't able just to see the scenes, but they were able to also hear, uh, to see the voices, to see that which is usually not seen. How can you hear a voice? What does that mean? And in short, what this means is that they were on a such a high level of, of divine consciousness. When God came down on the mountain and elevated them all, including our entire world, the Jewish people were able to see the voices in others, to be so one with others that they felt them. They didn't just hear their troubles or their complaints, but they felt them, they saw them. They, they entered their shoes so fully that they became one with them, one with their joy, and one with their pain, one with their voices, one with that which is usually not seen by the naked eye. That's what it means that the people saw the voices. I think that that's the also, that's the most important ingredient, I think, in every leader. If you wish to be a leader, you first and foremost have to be able to truly feel others, to feel their pain. You can't connect to others if you don't see their voices, if you don't feel them. And it's up to us now, especially in our times, I think, to be leaders in our own rights, to be able to truly feel the other. Yes, sometimes we have our own ways of looking at things, our own perspectives that are influenced by education, by our upbringing, by our culture, by our society, whatever it may be. But these times, more than any other times, demand from each and every one of us to open up our horizons and start seeing things from other people's perspectives, thinking of, uh, of, of life in other people's terms, not just in our own terms. 
And we see this also in the beautiful story about Jacob. Jacob, who is uh, uh, now uh, going to uh, Haran, to his uncle, he's fleeing he's, the wrath of his brother, Esav, who wants to murder him. If you remember that biblical story, he arrives finally uh, to the city of Haran. And I'm going to read the verses. Jacob arrives after a long journey from the land of Canaan at the city of Haran. There he encounters a well, <clears throat> surrounded by a number of shepherds and a sheep lying beside it. Jacob approaches, approaches these shepherds. The Torah records the detailed conversation as follows. And Jacob said to them, my brothers, where are you from? He tells these shepherds, my brothers, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. And he said to them, oh, great. Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, yes, we know him. And then he goes on to rebuke them. And he says to them, are things going well with them? And they said, yes, everything is well. And his daughter is coming. And then he says, the day is yet long. He says to these shepherds, it is not the time to take in the livestock. Water the sheep already and go pasture. In other words, you shepherds, I don't know you. I just met you. But it seems like you are uh, not doing that which you were asked to do. You are supposed to be shepherds. You are supposed to be nurturing your sheep. And here you are stealing almost the, the, the time that was allocated to your work by going to the well and just hanging around and resting. You're supposed to be working. What are you doing here? Just hanging, you know, as my, as my kids say, chilling. Why are you chilling here by the well? <laughs> well? Go and water the sheep and go and pasture, he tells them. You're supposed to be working. Now, what's interesting is that the shepherds cooperated with Jacob. And they said to him, you know what? You're right. We're going to go back to work. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were to come to someone who's slacking and you say to him, hey, why are you slacking? You should be working right now. It's time for work. Why are you, and, and you don't even know that someone. How do you think the reaction of that someone will be to you? They'll either dismiss you completely and say, hey, mind your own business. Or maybe they'll even fight with you. But they certainly won't react like the shepherds reacted to Jacob's rebuke. So why all of a sudden did they listen to Jacob and say, you know what, you're right, we're going to go back and work. We shouldn't have been chilling. And the answer, my friends, I think, is uh, included here in just two words. Or it's actually one word in Hebrew that Jacob says to them even before speaking with them. What does he say to them? My brothers. In Hebrew, Achai. Achai, my brothers, where are you from? He established a relationship of love first with those shepherds speaking to them as if they were his brothers. After you love and you show your unconditional care for someone, then you can rebuke them. Then your words will be heard. And I think this, again, alludes to here the second ingredient, that before we even start telling people what to do and what not to do, before we start criticizing and judging and rebuking people, we first have to establish a relationship of love. Call them my brothers and mean it. My brothers, my sisters, we are one with you. We are one family. Once you've established that rapport, then the rebuke can come. Fortunately, too often in our society, we jump to rebuking, to criticizing, to judging, to, to putting others down without even loving, without even caring, without even fathoming that they are our own brothers and sisters, that we are indeed one. And that, I think, is what Jacob here portrays. Uh, um, I, I, there's a third, we can go into these references, but there's a third place in the Torah that also speaks of that oneness with the other, that ability to love and to care. And that's the place where we speak about the poor man's sacrifice. But the poor man's sacrifice in the times of the temples, both the first and the second temple, was the sacrifice of a little bird. And you had to bur burn not just the bird, but the entirety of the bird, the feathers also, as it says here in Leviticus. Now, I don't know if you've ever smelled the smell of burnt feathers, but the smell of burnt feathers is, is abhorrent. It, it smells really, really, really bad. So why did God call the sacrifice a satisfying aroma to him? This is what I'm yeah, quoting from the verse. A satisfying aroma to him. After all, every human being knows that it's not a satisfying aroma. When a man brings a sacrifice and burns feathers of birds, it stinks. It's certainly not a satisfying. Is God lying to us? 
What is this saying? But what God is saying is that I am not looking at the bird. I'm not looking at the feathers or at the smell of the feathers. What I'm looking at is at the poor man and his heart. That's what I'm looking at. And to me, there is no greater aroma than feeling someone else's heart, feeling someone else's devotion, feeling someone else's love. That's the greatest, the most satisfying aroma to God that can exist. Yes, technically it might smell, but essentially, spiritually, it's the most delicious aroma of all. And in a way, I think this is what is sometimes so lacking in our society, the ability to feel the other, to hear the voice, but also to look beyond the smelly feathers or the externalities of life and see the heart, feel the heart, feel the love of the other. Look at a poor man, but see someone that's so rich inside. That's what's so missing. And that therefore I think is ingredient number two. You know, I'm reminded of the great story of um, Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liadi, I think it was, who was once fundraising for um, um, poor people in his village uh, who just didn't have enough money, not just to buy food, but also winter was coming and they uh, needed these poor people, as everyone back then needed, wood to burn the wood and create a fire in the home so that they could stay warm in the winter. Anyway, he was fundraising during the winter and uh, the poor people were already getting very, very cold. It was freezing outside. And he goes to this, uh, to the, the home of, very, of a very wealthy man, knocks on the door, and uh, his helper, his uh, assistant, opens the door and says, yes, Rabbi, how can I help you? The man says, uh, the rabbi says, uh, you know how you can help me if you call your boss. I need to speak to him for something very, very important. Uh, the man says, the assistant says to the rabbi, no problem, I'll call him, why don't you come in? The rabbi says, no, I'll stay here. I'll stay here by the entrance. After a few minutes, the boss, the wealthy man comes and he says to the rabbi, how can I help you, rabbi? The rabbi says, look, I gotta tell you, I'm here once again to ask for charity for the poor people in our village. They have nothing to eat and they have no wood to burn and they are freezing right now. The wealthy man tells the rabbi, well, why don't you come into the home? I'll write you a check. I'll give you money, but come inside. Don't, don't stand here. It's freezing. The rabbi says, no, no, no. I'm going to stay here and I'll tell you why. I'm going to stay here so that you can feel the freezing cold that these poor people are feeling. If you bring me into your home, you're going to forget about it. But if you feel this cold, you'll give charity in a generous way because you will have felt exactly what these poor people are feeling each and every day and each and every night. That, I think, that, that message Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Ladi was teaching us was, again, what, what a true leader is, what a true uh, contributor of society is. Someone that can feel the other person's pain to the point that they are one with it. They, they are so obsessed with knowing, with that heart in the other, that they, they, they will do anything and everything to feel that pain, to be one with the other. That's ingredient number two, the ingredient of um, love and of care. I'll conclude here speaking of a poor person's sac sacrifice and the terrible smell that those feathers have with the words of the Lubavitcher Rebbe of Ashnirsen of blessed memory in the Kutei Sikhot where he says what we explain. When the Torah tells us to leave the feathers on the bird and place it that way on the burning altar so as not to embarrass the pauper, in other words, to burn the entire bird, tells us what the burnt feathers will generate a pleasant aroma to God. They will smell as sweet as the most succulent beef. For, and then why? For can there be a more delightful smell to God than the one which spares embarrassment from a poor Jew? You and I may experience the smell of the burning feathers as awful, but for God, if this is conferring upon a poor Jew more dignity, strength, and joy, can you conceive of a more fragrant aroma than this? Giving him that ability to bring a sacrifice, even though he's not rich, he's poor, that uh, gives him the ability also to express his heart, and there's no greater aroma than that. That's ingredient number two. Again, feel free to unmute yourself and voice your questions, disagreements, opinions, because this is what learning is all about. Otherwise, we'll Have just I? ingredient number three. Yes, Joyce, please. Yeah, first of all, thank you. This is so beautiful. It is so powerful. Thank you. And um, I, I can feel it, and I can see it related to everything that's happening. 
and the what when you talked about you know seeing the voices right. uh, the, God's love and seeing the voices um, feeling the voices um, and then the relationship establishing the relationship you know of love first is love not to hurt people not to malign them not to not to be racist Right. But to love them as your brothers and your sisters, because we are all one and created by God, which is what you were saying. Right. And I loved what you said about feeling the heart of the person and looking past what we see with our, and you know, what I always say is looking past what we see with our everyday eyes. But I think what is in the scriptures or what you've said in the Torah and the, and the stories are so important and that the right. terrible smell is really the beauty even now with all that's going on with the coronavirus with the with the the um god bringing forward the voices is god bringing right. forward the voices for us to hear so i feel very passionate as you can tell and i thank you it's it's touching me right. very deeply. no thank you so much thank you thank you uh, yeah it's true i mean and and i like what you said that the feathers themselves it's not just the heart behind them what you just said that the feathers themselves are so beautiful. Uh, you know, it's interesting because they say that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah. Uh, and I think in a way Judaism uh, believes that because, um, uh, but, uh, because it's, it's how we see things. But I would say that Judaism also adds another thing. And that is that beauty is, and you can stop, you can uh, add a period right there. Beauty is. Uh, in the eyes of the, if the beholder sees it or not, then that's his problem. But beauty is, beauty exists in everything. Then we just have to train our eyes so that uh, we can see the beauty in everything. But um, beauty is in everything, even in burnt feathers. You know, I, I, um, I think that many of us know that, I, I'm just reminded of this yesterday, I was speaking to someone who's going through uh, many, many treatments for cancer. And he's been going from hospital to hospital now for, for a year and a half. And um, um, he told me something so beautiful. And he, he compared life to uh, marriage. I, said, so, I asked him how, and he said, look, before I got married, I thought I loved my wife. After I got married, we started fighting and many tribulations. But that only grew the love even more. Now I've been married for so many years, and now I think I truly love my wife. I think it, it, it's the same with life. Before we begin life, we think that everything is bliss, right? We say ignorance is bliss, and everything is great. But then life hits you. And then you say to yourself, gosh, is this really what life is? This is this what joy in life is about? And this is what this cancer uh, a patient was saying. But now I appreciate life so much more. Uh, he was telling me about how he's, he, he, he had to kill a um, black widow the other day and it like killed him because he started seeing divinity even in the smallest and most dangerous of creatures and uh, he lives life in a much deeper way but I'm thinking of him because of what you just said Joyce that sometimes even the cancer itself brings so much blessing and he that saying that's not, not in my words in the words of a cancer patient himself that you live life on a deeper level life itself is so much more beautiful, specifically through the challenges, through the burnt feathers. And we learn to appreciate that uh, with the tribulations of life. So thank you, beautiful. Okay, all right, ingredient number three, being made of one piece. So yesterday, I mean, yesterday, ingredient number one was about starting to change the relationships from within. This ingredient is about starting to cha change the relationship with our own selves, that we have to be made of one piece. It's interesting, and I, I think I've mentioned this in the past uh, a long time ago, but we spoke about the tabernacle, and it's interesting, by the way, in, not, it's, it, this, this, uh, the menorah will take the center stage, not of this coming portion, the Shabbat, but of the following Shabbat, the portion of Baalotcha. But we speak about how the menorah had to be made of one piece. God commanded Moses to make the menorah miksha. Miksha, which again means hammered out of a single piece of metal, silver, or gold. It was made out of gold. Now, 
You don't have to be a skilled craftsman to appreciate how hard and difficult that is. To make a menorah of seven candelabras out of one piece, that's almost impossible. Why would, give, why would God give this, this level of difficulty to Moses or to anyone who was building the menorah? Why couldn't he just say, make it as you want, out of seven pieces, one for each candelabra? Why one piece? But the answer, I think, speaks to something very profound, and that is that if we wish to be menorahs ourselves, if we wish to illuminate, to take the light within, that divinity within, and ensure that it shines upon the world like the menorah does, then we too have to be made of one piece. We can't, as we know, we can't say, you know what, I want to start a diet, but I love cheesecake. I love uh, golf, but I know I have to go to show on Yom Kippur or on Shabbat or whatever it is. I, I want to do this, but I want to... You can't live a fragmented life if you are to be a menorah. You two have to be made of one piece. You have to practice what you preach and you have to practice what you believe and vice versa. You have to believe what you practice too. That's the only way one can be a menorah. And I think that the, there's an episode going back to King Solomon in the Bible, in the Torah, that speaks exactly about these two pieces. But we all know the story and here are the verses of the story of uh, this woman. You know what, let's read the verses. My Lord, uh, uh, the background story first. Uh, there was a woman who gave birth and um, two or three days after she gave birth, she was un un accidentally lying on a child and the child was dead. And this um, was devastated. Uh, she was devastated by that. And uh, she decided, well, I can't continue without a baby. My son is dead. So she went and stole a different baby from another mother. And she traded her son with that baby so that when that other mother woke up, she woke up to a dead baby. When a real child was really alive, but it was stolen by, by another mother. Anyway, she quickly realized, the mother from which the child was stolen, quickly realized that her child was stolen. So she goes to, um, and she finds out exactly who this woman is that stole a child. We know that story. And she says, well, come to court with me, to King Solomon's court, because I believe that the child that you're holding is really my child. You gave me your dead child. The child that you're holding is my child. And they went to King Solomon's court, and King Solomon now is faced with two mothers fighting over one baby. Now, one of the mothers is the real mother of the child. King Solomon has to decide who that mother is. What does King Solomon do? Let's read the verses. My Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house, and I gave birth to a child, but she was in the house. And the third day after I gave birth, she also gave birth. This woman's child died during the night because she lay on him. She arose during the night and took my son from my side while I slept, laid him on her bosom, and laid her dead child on my bosom. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. The story we just explained. But when I observed him in the morning, I realized that he was not my son to whom I had given birth. The other woman replied, it is not so. My son is the live one and your son is the dead one. King Solomon briefly reiterated their arguments and ordered, bring me a sword. The king, King Solomon then said, cut the living child into two and give half, give half to one and half to the other. The woman who claimed that her son was stolen, the real mother in other words from her said, please my master, give her the child and do not kill it. But the other woman said, neither mine nor yours shall he be cut. The king spoke up and said, give the first woman the living child and do not kill it, for she is the real mother. Now, the, the simple meaning of this is, of course, a real mother would never want to see a child cut into two. So the minute she, is, she shouted, no, 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 you know what, fine, I'll give up on my child, but let him live, let him be cut, she, she showed, who the real mother was. She showed what a true mother is all about. While the other woman couldn't care less if the child was cut. So obviously she wasn't the right mother. That was the wisdom of King Solomon and it's a famous biblical story. But what was King Solomon really suggesting? Was he, I, I dare ask, was he really suggesting to cut the child into two, God forbid? King Solomon became all of a sudden a, a, a potential murderer? What does this mean, cut the child into two? Couldn't you think of a better idea to come up with this solution? You were the wisest of all. You could have thought, I mean, cut a child. And what King Solomon was really saying is that, no, if a child is to live, 
cut between two different voices, then that is death to a child. If I give my children two conflicting messages, I kill them spiritually. That's death to a child. That's what King Solomon is teaching you. That when we say one thing, but we do something else, that kills the child spiritually, especially in the lesson that we are trying to teach. Because if we, ought, if we want to be menorahs, if we want to truly illuminate our children and our surroundings, we first have to be made of one piece. We can't say one thing and do something else. This is the deeper meaning of the story of King Solomon. You know, I've often spoken about the Hebrew school model, and I wrote about this once a long time ago. But I, 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 I know I'm going against the mainstream here, but I, I think that very often the Hebrew school model is not a successful one. Why? Because often parents come and say to their children, you know what, you have to go to Hebrew school. Why? You don't really care. Uh, no, you have to go. I went, when I was a child, you have to go. So they drop off the child. They drop off the child and go and have their Starbucks. When it comes to Judaism, very often, I'm not talking about any one year, of course. The proof is in the pudding. You are all year studying Torah, so you do care. But very often, unfortunately, we see parents where they tell the children to do Judaism, but they themselves are not engaged at all. At all, not on a charity level and not on a attendance level and not, but yet the child has to go to Hebrew school. And I think that that's the greatest uh, uh, disservice we are doing to our children. When we say to them, you have to do this, but we belong somewhere else, then we are communicating fragmentation. And a, a fragmented human being cannot be a menorah, cannot light. And I wrote, I wrote about this as mentioned a long time ago, and I said that the drop off level, uh, the drop off mentality is what creates the drop out outcome. When you drop off your child and you say, that's you, I'm something else, then eventually the child will drop out of Judaism altogether because he will have been raised with a fragmented menorah and a fragmented menorah simply cannot light up. I think it's true, especially in our society, the third ingredient. And often we say to ourselves, yes, 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 I love humanity. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm for all, and every, but really deep inside we believe other things. I'm not saying anyone, God forbid, here says that and, and believes that. But if we are to truly make an impact and illuminate our menorahs, let's first believe in the ideals that we are selling. You know, Mark Twain famously said, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. That was his line. <laughs> but, but, very often people are like, oh, I love you, many. I wish there could be peace everywhere, right? God forbid, no. Uh, the, the, everyone should be living, our brothers and sisters. Do you act that way? Do you truly believe in that yourself? Oh, maybe not. People I can't stand, like Mark Twain was saying. Well, then, then that's where the problem begins. Then you won't be able to eliminate your menorah. And that's, therefore, ingredient number three that I think is so crucial. Be the change yourself now, not just in your broken relationships, but yourself. Be the change indeed that you want to see in the world. Okay, and then ingredient number four again, unless there's someone who wants to voice anything, any word. No? <laughs> okay, fine. So ingredient number four is, I think that's something that's also missing from our society. It might not be the most important ingredient, but I think it's, it's, it's an important one nonetheless. And that I learned from the book of Ruth that we just read this past weekend over the festival of Shavuot, but the book of Ruth is read on Shavuot because on Shavuot, it's a yard site, it's the day of passing of King David. And we know that King David was the great grandson of Ruth. The Ruth, the convert, Ruth, that's where he came from. So in his honor, we read the book of Ruth. But in the book of Ruth, we read about how she came to the land of um, Boaz, who was a very wealthy farmer of the time uh, a very uh, high up farmer and, and dignitary. And um, in that first encounter between Ruth and Boaz, Boaz said to himself, well, I'm falling in love with this woman, but I don't want to show it because then people are going to start speaking about me. I had tried to start up with a lady that was on my field. So he goes out to her and he offers her just a little meal that comprised of some corn to eat. Now, 
The Midrash says something quite fascinating, and it says that if Boaz had known that the Torah, the Bible, would have written about him in that encounter, he would have gone all the way. He would have offered her fattened calves. Let's read the Midrash that speaks about Boaz and two more characters that also hesitated and did not go all the way. But this is what the Midrash has to say. Rabbi Yitzchak said, when a person does a mitzvah, he should do it with all his heart. First example is the example of Reuben. Had Reuben known that the Torah would record these words and Reuben heard that his brothers were plotting to kill Joseph and he saved him from their hands, he would have carried Yosef back to his, father's, to his father on his shoulders. Just the background here. Yosef was thrown into a pit by his brothers who hated him. Joseph, as the oldest one, said to himself, well, I'm responsible for this child, but I don't want to fight with my brothers now, so I'm going to wait until they go. Then I'll come back to the pit and take, rescue Joseph and take him out. Now, had he known that the Torah was going to write about his episode, he wouldn't have cared about fighting with his brothers. He would have gone in the pit and carried him on his shoulders back to his father. Because when a person does a mitzvah, he should do it with all his heart. Example number one. Example number two is Aaron. Had Aaron known the Torah would write about him and he will see you, Moses, and he will be joyous in his heart without jealousy over Moses' appointment as leaders of Israel, he too would have come out to greet Moses with dancing and drums. What does this mean? Moses is now, was now appointed as the leader of the Jewish people. He's coming back from Midian, from exile, and he's coming to Egypt to lead the Jewish people. Who's there to greet him? Aaron. Now Aaron said to himself, should I jump all over him and dance him and, and kiss him and hug him? And maybe not because people are going to say, oh, you're putting up the show because you're really jealous of him. He was appointed the leader, not you. So you're trying to cover this up and therefore you're hugging him so intensely. So what did Aaron really do? Aaron just said hello nicely, politely, but he certainly didn't hug him and dance with drums. But again, yeah, the Midrash says, if Aaron had known that, that the Torah would have written about this encounter with Moses, he would have come out to greet him with dancing and drums. Why? Because again, when you do a mitzvah, you have to do it all your heart without any consideration of what people might just say. And then the third example is the example of Boaz, again, that we spoke about. Had he known that the Torah write about him, um, he would have fed her Ruth fattened calves. Now, this alludes here to the fourth and, and, um, the fourth and one of the important ingredients, I think, to repairing relationships, to healing our world with harmony. Very often we say to ourselves, or oh, maybe should I interact, should I not interact? Should I visit him? Should I not visit him? Should I uh, send out this email uh, to cheer a person up? Should I not? And we make all sorts of excuses and rationalizations to ourselves, saying, no, 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 better I'll stay in my bubble and let them stay in their bubble. That's why the expression, live and let live. But Judaism does not believe in that. In fact, what's fascinating about the Hebrew language is that there are many words that exist in English that do not exist in Hebrew. Why? Because the Hebrew language does not believe in those words and what they stand for. One of those words is tolerance. We don't believe in tolerance. To, to tolerate means you be you, I'll be me. We won't necessarily look at each other too much. I'll tolerate you. I don't really like it, but, but, but I'll tolerate you. You'll tolerate me. And like this, we'll live and let live and, and, and the world will be happy. No, we don't believe in tolerance. We believe in going all the way. We believe in reaching out to people and giving our entire heart. We believe in seeing a Ruth that might be a stranger from a strange land and feeding her with fattened calves. We believe in rescuing people out of the pits by putting them on our shoulders and carrying them out of their own troubles. We believe in giving our all to all at all times. That's what we believe in. That, that's why uh, the Midrash year concludes, the, the first part that we just read concludes in the most beautiful way, it says in the days of yore, a person did the mitzvah and the prophet transcribed it as the prophets transcribed uh, the story about Boaz and Ruth and, uh, and so on. But it says now when a person does a mitzvah who transcribes it, we might hesitate because oh, no one's caring anymore. No one's writing about it. What does the Midrash says? Elijah and Mashiach write about it, transcribe our, our deeds that are done with a full heart. And then God then signs it. What a beautiful image. That when we do a mitzvah with our heart, when we reach out to someone else, not just by tolerating them and being polite to them, but really giving our all 
to all, at all times, Elijah and Mashiach are witnesses and God signs on those deeds and partners with us. That I think is also what is so crucially needed. You know, we live in a society where everyone is comfortable in their own corner. One of the great things, you know, coming from outside to this beautiful and very special country, United States of America, many years ago, one of the things that shocked me the most, it, I came from Israel, I wasn't born in Israel, but you know, I came from Israel, lived in Israel, grew up in Israel from the age of 13. So I was entrenched in Israeli society and I come here to America and we lived in Atlanta at first. And then uh, we, we settled down in this apartment complex uh, in Sandy Springs, for those of you maybe familiar with Atlanta. And I realized, gosh, the neighbors don't even talk to you here. So we went and we brought some cookies and try to make friends and not, success, not successfully, unfortunately. While in Israel, not only does your neighbor know you, but he walks into your home whenever he feels he or she feels like it, with or without your permission. There is this ability to connect to others with all your heart, as we are speaking about, that barely exists in other places. In Italy, I lived in Italy too, maybe that exists there a little bit. But we don't really see that. And maybe that's because of the comfort bubbles that we live in. We're comfortable in our own corner, in our own home, that the other doesn't really matter or that we don't really care about that. If we have to be polite, we'll be polite. But I think it's time to restore this love, this going all the way, this sacrificing ourselves for the good and the welfare of the other. That's what we do as human beings. That's why God created us in communities, in neighborhoods, so that we can indeed uh, uh, create communities with you know, the word community is the word unity, communities that, ha that are united in heart and united in soul. I think that uh, it's interesting because there is that Talmudic passage that says, Kol Israel Aravim every Jew is a guarantor for another. We're all mixed together. But um, there is also a verse that speaks about the entire world being like that. Uh, uh, and that's a verse in the Song of Songs where God relates to his, this world as a garden, as a garden that we have to harvest, that we have to plant, that we have to grow. And if we don't do the growing within our own communities, with all our heart, as farmers would do with their own trees and with their own creation, then the garden of God will remain barren, will remain fruitless. And that's not the way God sees the world and therefore it certainly shouldn't be the way we see the world we have to give this garden and everyone in that garden are all. I want to conclude with this poem that I think I've mentioned in the past, but a poem by a Brazilian poet. He's one of the most famous ones. He's uh, certainly a best-selling one. Um, and uh, he speaks about um, uh, 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 this child. This is a poem as if a child was writing to his parent, to his or her parent. Uh, and this poem is called, When You Thought I Wasn't Looking. Uh, I think this poem conveys most this fourth ingredient. It goes like this. When you thought I wasn't looking, a child again, he's writing to his old parent. You hung my first painting on the ref refrigerator and I wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, you fed a homeless man and I thought it was good to be kind to strangers. When you thought I wasn't looking, you baked a birthday cake just for me and I knew that you cared for me in the little things. When you thought I wasn't looking, you said a prayer and I believed. It was a God that I could always talk to. When you thought I wasn't looking, you kissed me goodnight and I felt love. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears coming from your eyes. And I learned that some things, sometimes things hurt, but it's all right to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, you smiled and it made me want to smile too. When you thought I wasn't looking, you cared and I wanted to be everything I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked and I wanted to say thanks for all those things you did when you thought I wasn't looking. Very often we say to ourselves, well, maybe I won't do this mitzvah or that mitzvah and engage with the other as we spoke about. No one's looking anyway, no one cares anyway. But friends, our children are looking. Society is looking. Elijah and Mashiach are looking. God is looking. And therefore we should do things all the way as this parent did when he baked the birthday cake for that uh, child of his, or when he kissed him goodnight or when, he, saw the, when uh, he smiled and when he cared for someone else. That makes an impact, makes an impact on our society. Each time we give our heart to another heart, 
it creates a society of hearts, society of love. And that's really what is uh, conveyed here by this fourth ingredient. I'm going to stop share and I want to hear from you. But to summarize very quickly, if we can all devote ourselves to those four ingredients, ingredient number one, to repair our own relationships, because uh, it's, it's really about starting with ourselves, starting about, uh, it's really about starting with, with the people that we know, not necessarily the people we don't know, they come second, but to seeing divinity in them, and then seeing divinity in every single human being. Number two, caring and loving everyone with all our hearts, establishing that relationship of, you are my brother, you are my sister, like Jacob did. Ingredient number three, being made of one piece, knowing that if we are to illuminate, we too have to believe and hold tight to the ideals that we preach, that we try and teach others. And ingredient number four, if we can give it our all when we do those mitzvahs, especially those interpersonal relationship mitzvahs, then no doubt a society can begin to heal and we will have lifted our uh, troubles, uh, ridden ourselves of them and, and uh, restored some health and some love and peace in our world.